evening, everyone. Welcome to another Live Stories Worldwide on a Monday evening, going out on Zoom, on uh, YouTube, and on Facebook. Can I encourage you to uh, let your friends know about this uh, broadcast that's going out tonight? We have a wonderful speaker who's going to be interviewed by George, our Live Stories Worldwide interviewer. And uh, if you have any questions tonight, any problems, will you please contact us on the Life Stories hotline? You've got the number on your screen. It is 07943-550-287. Or if you're um, in another country, it's plus 44-7943-550-287. Two eight seven. That is our dedicated per hotline. At the end, if you have any questions, then George will be willing to take those questions, and you can send them on your post on YouTube or on Zoom. But uh, tonight, as I say, we have a wonderful speaker, uh, Simon Thomas, a, a broadcaster and writer. Uh, Simon has been involved in highly successful broadcasting with BBC and Sky for over 20 years. He began his broadcasting career in 1999 with the children's program Blue Peter on BBC. And uh, he has a lot of wonderful things to share, how things have happened in his life, which have caused him to realize God is good. So right now, I'm going to hand over to George and Simon to do this program. Over to you, George and Simon. Thank you so much, Alan, and welcome, Simon. You're looking very well, I must say. In fact, <laughs> you're looking you enough to go back on Blue Peter. <laughs> <laughs> now, you do, realize, you do realize, of course, that coming on here, you're really going to be famous from us. You won't be able to go to shopping. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to um, our Zoom meeting. And, uh, as you know, on these meetings, we just talk to people about their lives and how God is uh, impacting their lives and just a bit about themselves, of course. I mean, we you know, everybody knows from reading Wikipedia right, about you that, you know, your life, you had broadcasting, very uh, good career. But tell us how it all began. I mean, what was your upbringing like and, you know, where you came from originally? So I, I grew up the son of a vicar. Um, my dad was a Church of England vicar. So we were, we were a Norfolk based family for the first 10 years of life. And then... I headed down to Surrey, where dad took over a church there. And then I think TV wise, broadcasting wise, the, I, I, I watched Blue Peter as a kid, loved it. just thought it was just a, an amazing program full of adventure. And I often used to sit there and think that would be an amazing program to work on. But I never, ever thought at that stage that I'd one day end up working on it. But it was really at university. So I went to Birmingham University to study history. Media studies as a course, there are hundreds of media studies courses out there now but back in 1992 there were very few so a little bit of advice from someone called jeremy vine whose family used to worship at my dad's church and he was in radio four at the time of course now he's on radio two and does lots of other stuff but he just said just get a degree and if you can get experience at university and broadcasting do that so we had an internal tv station at birmingham university called guild tv Nobody watched it. Literally nobody watched it. It was on in all the bars in the various uh, clubs in the Guild. And I started doing a programme on a Friday just called The Lunchbox. It was a fun magazine show, hour long with one other presenter. But the amazing thing was is that they they got a lot of secondhand TV equipment from a studio down the road called Pebble Mill. Now, some of you of a certain generation will remember Pebble Mill. It's yep. where all the BBC's morning output used to come from. So over the years, they'd amassed all this secondhand equipment. So we had a proper studio, three cameras, and it got you used to what it's actually like to do live TV, to have someone chatting in your ear while you're talking. And yeah, no one's watching it. But actually, I caught the bug. And as I came to leave university, someone said, you know, you really should try this for a job. And so I came out of university and to cut a very long story short, but I, I aimed for Blue Peter and I gave myself three and a half years. I remember from a Christian point of view, a really vivid moment. I was back in Beckles where my parents were living at the time they'd moved from from Surrey to Suffolk and that was dad's last church before he retired and I remember one afternoon I was sat there thinking is, th is this just a dream that I'm going to chase or is God in this and I always think as a Christian it's, it's always quite a good idea to involve God <laughs> in big decisions uh, so I prayed about it that afternoon and I sort of thought I'm just going to be really bold and I said God just give me a sign that I'm not about to waste the next three years of my life chasing a dream that's never going to come to fruition so I said my prayer and then a while later I went down to my dad's study at a desk a little bit like where I'm sat now 
And I was about to start writing letters on his computer to lots of different production companies, to Blue Peter and other programs to try and get some work experience, try and get a running job. And I just noticed this magazine, uh, and I think it was called the Alpha Magazine, but I don't think it was actually connected with what we now know as the Alpha course. And on the front cover, one of the sub headlines of the articles inside was why we need more Christians in the media. And I was like, goodness me. So I opened this magazine and it'd been actually written by a guy called Steve Chalk and Pam Rhodes, who was presenting on BBC Songs of Praise at the time. And it was like one of those moments where I don't know if you've sat in church or at a Christian event, wherever it might be when someone does a talk and you occasionally get those moments where it feels like that talk is just being aimed at you. And it was like this article had just been written to me and it was why we need more Christians in the mainstream media. It's okay having magazines and Christian radio stations, but we also need Christians in the mainstream media. And I just thought that's my answer. So for the next three years, I chased it down. I tried uh, applying for the job two times, got absolutely nowhere, got that letter that comes back, says, keep your details on file. Anybody who knows anything about TV knows that's a no, just a polite way of putting it. And then in 1999, um, through unfortunate circumstances for him, one of their presenters, Richard Bacon, got sacked in very famous circumstances. I remember it well, actually. Yeah, and, and there was an opening. And I thought, this is it. I'm going to give it one last roll of the dice. I'm going to try one final time. And, and after a long process of an interview and then eventually an audition, uh, I got the job. So that, that in a nutshell is how I went from being a little boy growing up in Norfolk to becoming Blue Peter's 27th presenter. I mean, you said yourself, you know, that Blue Peter was iconic and everybody wants to be on it and do things on it. I mean, did you ever dream when you were going to school and you were a kid that you would actually do it? No, 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 no. I just thought I used to watch it and think that would be an amazing thing to do for a job, you know, to, to get paid to, to travel the world, to try a lot of different experiences that people either pay very, very good money for or will never get the chance to do. And that was your daily life. You know, you never knowing from one week to the next. Yes, you knew what, when you were in the studio, what the live shows were. But in terms of films, not never quite knowing what the next week was going to bring. And it could mean suddenly a, a trip abroad out of the blue. I remember getting to the end of a summer holiday a few years ago. I knew already I was going to Belize uh, to dive something called, called the Blue Hole. So I was very excited about that trip. You know, as going back to work in September goes, a trip to Belize isn't bad. And then literally... <laughs> A day later, as I was getting ready for this filming trip in, a, in 10 days time, this, look, there's a new film coming out made by Pixar called Finding Nemo. And it's all about this fish that lives on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And we want to do a whole film on it. So you're the only presenter who can dive. So would you mind going to Australia before you go to Belize? So two days later, you're getting on a plane to go and dive the Barrier Reef for three days. That, that is just, that's the dream job, which is why so many people wanted to do it. Life stories worldwide is broadcast live every Monday night at 8pm UK time. We broadcast on YouTube, Facebook and StreamYard. Why not join us every Monday night at 8pm UK time for Life Stories Worldwide. Speak to us here at Life Stories Worldwide, you can, simply by dialing plus four four seven nine four three double five zero two eight seven call us now very exciting um before you landed the blue peter job did you have a plan b i mean was there a career path you had in mind that you wanted to be maybe an engineer or a teacher or something like that that's a or very maybe, good question because, or maybe go into ministry after your dad. Uh, yeah I've, I've had that mentioned a few times but I, I definitely think it's it's a calling not not following the family trade so i haven't i haven't felt that call yet um no the honest answer is i didn't i didn't have a firm plan b um so i've often wondered well what would life have looked like had that moment in 99 not come about you know the question of what would have happened is one in life that we can ask ourselves many times because ultimately as c.s lewis says in in the chronicles of narnia and Aslan used to say, the, the story of what would have happened has never, ever been told. So ultimately, I don't know. I mean, I worked in Selfridges for two years after coming out of university to pay the bills whilst trying to get media experience. I don't think I'd have ended up at Selfridges long term. Um, I mean, I nearly went for the police force, but uh, due to a dodgy knee, didn't get anywhere. So, George, the honest answer is I have no idea what I'd have done if this hadn't worked out. Hey, good. Thing is, of course, on Blue Peter and uh, you've landed the iconic. How did you actually feel when you got the words that you've got the job? Uh, without doubt, the most exciting 
but surreal moment ever in in life. So I'm not sure there's some people watching this from from elsewhere who probably think, what well, I don't understand this program at all. But it's it's been on air for 60 years, and it's it's uh, it's an iconic, as you mentioned, BBC show. And when you get the job, I remember walking out as she was the head of children's at the BBC at the time. And this appointment was really important because of what had happened to Richard Bacon. There was always going to be a lot of media interest in who was going to replace the guy who's got sacked for taking cocaine. And they wanted to get it right. So it was a very long process. But I remember that night and she cracked open a bottle of champagne. I had a, a glass of champagne with her and the editor of the program. And then... I was told you can't tell anybody for the next three weeks because we want to try and protect you and your family. So just please only tell your close family. But as I walked out her office, there on the wall is all the pictures of the 26 previous presenters. And he kind of looked at it and thought, I've just joined the most exclusive club in the land. I'm the 27th member. There's never been any more than 27. Uh, and that's, that's just a really surreal moment. I remember standing at... Um, at the tube station in Wood Lane, just outside the BBC, and thinking, I can't really tell anybody, but this is going to change my life. It really is going to change everything. And it was, yeah, without doubt, the most surreal and exciting moment of life thus far. Did you think at that point, wow, I've made it, I've made the BBC? Yeah, I did a little bit. I remember sort of looking as I walked out of Television Centre, um, as it was then, obviously it's it's changed now, but um, just looking behind me and on the side of, it's a very famous logo that people have seen on the side of the building, which is Studio One, this huge studio where I did my audition, and just seeing BBC Television Centre, as I sort of looked back and thought, Crocky, that's now my office, that's where I'm going to be working. And, you know, for so long, it felt like those gates would never be prized open. That I'd never be someone walking in with the the lanyard and the and the and the little pass that says BBC with, with your photo on it, which a lot of people, if I'm honest, used to wear with great pride on the tube just to let everyone know sitting around them that they work for the BBC. But yes, it was a a magnificent moment to think, crikey, I've just become a, a BBC presenter. Now you got the job, okay? You're the new kid on the block. And um, how did the other presenters, um, you know, welcome you? Or when you came along? I think looking back on it, not just for the presenters, but for everyone working in the show, it was quite a strange time. I think everybody knew that really the BBC had no choice but to terminate Richard Bacon's contract. Mm -hmm. you know, but he was a very, very popular presenter, not just with the viewers, but also with the people who worked on the show, the other presenters and the production staff, a really popular figure. He's a, he's a really, he's a, he's a fun character. He's, he's great company. I've met him you know, many times down the years. So th there was, because this was probably, I, I got the job probably about a month and a half after he'd gone. Um, and there was, a, there was a little bit of a sense in which people were still kind of mourning his, his loss. You know, they, they didn't really want to be having to welcome a new presenter in. But here I was, I've just been given this amazing opportunity. And I think for a time, I'm not saying people were unfriendly, they were, but I could, I could really sense that there was, there was still a lot of people upset by what had happened to Richard and it weren't quite in the place yet where they were ready to sort of welcome with huge open arms a new presenter, but they knew they needed one because the show's on air three times a week. You're making films every week, you, you know, it's too much work for three of them. So I think the presenters were relieved I've arrived because I'll take on some of the work, but the production staff, they, they took a little bit of time to warm up to me, which, which was difficult because, you know, it's one of those sliding doors moments in life, isn't it? You've been given an opportunity by what's happened and, and you've got to take it. You're never going to say no, but it was, a, it was an unusual time to get it. Now you've joined the program, of course, and uh, we only ever see the finished pro um, process on telly and TV. You all look great. You're all great and friendly. Was there ever any tension behind the scenes where, like, I think I should be doing such and such or, you know, I should have that job. Uh, I'm better at that and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the, listen, there's always a little bit of that because, you know, it's something I was always always determined to do. And that was not let a job like that change me as a person. I didn't want to be seduced by fame or or any of the trappings that come with with doing a very public job so that kind of side didn't interest me and I, I it meant a lot to me when people said you you haven't changed at all 
you know, between when you joined the show and when you left, you're still the same Simon. So I always felt it was really important to treat everybody as, as your equal, whether they're the camera person, the sound man, whoever it is, we're a team. We, I always used to describe us like we're like a football team. The presenters are the finishers. They're the strikers. They're the ones who, like in a game of football, get the glory. But without all the men behind them in a, in a football team, you're nothing. And it was the same for us. So I was always really conscious of of being appreciative of, of being in a team. Um, but, you know, there, yeah, there's always going to be there's always going to be little stressful moments. They'd, they'd often come on summer trips because you'd be away filming for five weeks in some really amazing locations. But five weeks filming in India, which is just incredibly hot and humid. And you're on the go pretty much every day. You don't really get any days off. Uh, you know, when when people get tired, then, then people get a bit, a bit upset with each other. I remember going on a trip to San Francisco. Uh, and Matt Baker, who I worked with for many years, it was me and Matt doing San Francisco. And, and we did a few independent films and then we did some filming together. And there was one iconic shot in this film, which was Matt and I driving a red Corvette. It's very easy to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Life Stories at Lunch, to receive notifications of when we are live. Simply click the bell. If you would like to contact us here at Life Stories Worldwide, you can simply by emailing lifestoriesworldwide at gmail.com or visit our website at lifestoriesworldwide.com. Everything else is false. Mm -hmm. uh, soft top with the roof down over the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, just an amazing moment. And Richard, the director, said Simon's going to be driving. And I only heard later on, because he didn't say this in front of me, that Matt wasn't very happy that he wasn't driving. You know, it's a bit of male testosterone, a bit of egos going on. So he wanted to drive. But yeah, you, you listen, when there's a team of four of you, you're always going to get moments like that. But I think the reason why the period I was on, it was so such a good time to be part of the show because we were genuinely friends. You know, we weren't, we didn't just put it on for the, for the cameras at five o'clock on a Monday afternoon. We, we socialized together uh, and are still friends to this day. Now you mentioned earlier about your dad, of course, with the vicar and uh, hmm. somebody mentioned to you, but they need more Christians in media. When you went into the job, did you have that in your mind as well uh, to be a Christian in the media, to bring them the, the gospel message with you? Yes, that's a good, it's a good question because that, that I found quite difficult at first because, because there was an awful lot of publicity about me getting the job because of what had come before. I think the media made a lot of the fact that I was a vicar's son and also that I was a Christian because they're looking at it and going, you couldn't get a, a safer bet than going for a vicar's son. Little do they know about many other vicar's sons who haven't gone the same way, but they, they kind of, they, they painted me as this kind of Christian goody two shoes, you know, not going to make the same mistake as Richard Bacon. And I, I did feel quite a lot of expectation from the UK Christian world because I, you get so many emails and letters and requests to visit churches or visit big youth events and, you know, and people saying we're praying for you regularly and all those kind of things, which was lovely. But I'd always be, you know, and some people would write as directly as to say, we really look forward to you sharing your faith on, on, on Blue Peter. Now, there were one or two films I did where I did speak about my faith because it fitted in with what we were doing. But, you know, how, how do you share your faith on a TV programme? You can't sort of come on air at five o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon and go, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Blue Peter. And just while we're here, let me just tell you, God loves you and he's died for you and he's forgiven your sins. Amen. Right. Later on the program, we've got to make, you know, you can't, you'd lose your job. So it was quite hard, that kind of expectation that, that, that suddenly we've got this Christian on a, on a high profile show and lots has been talked about him in the press about the fact he's a Christian that I felt, I did feel a lot of pressure actually, that, that I was supposed to use this position, but actually I felt being a Christian was more about, as it always should be, about your actions and your words and, and how you conduct yourself, not whether you open your mouth live on the television and, and, and declare God's forgiveness for everybody. And how did you actually cope with that pressure at the time? Um, I think I just got better at knowing what to say yes to and what to say no to. You, you kind of feel, oh, I need to go and do that. And I, 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 there was definitely a period, George, where I felt I, felt I was just, you know, it, it was another Christian event I was going to that weekend or the next week. And, and, and I thought people eventually, they're going to get bored of hearing, you know, 
of Simon Thomas always popping up at any particularly youth event. So I became much better at going, that's really worth doing. But actually these others, you know, just for my own well-being and actually to manage my time and to have actually some time to yourself, you know, in a show that demands so much of you. Uh, I just became good at kind of filtering out what was worth doing and no offence to them, but wasn't, you know, wasn't so worth doing. Um, yeah. And how did you manage to keep your feet on the ground? As you see, that let the fame get to you. How did you manage to keep your feet on the ground and keep grounded? Well, I kept the same set of friends. My friends didn't change. They were always good, very good at keeping me grounded. Um, and I think it's seeing, seeing the job for what it is. It's an incredibly privileged job to do. Uh, a wonderful job to do, but it's just a TV program at the end of the day, and we're not, we're not saving lives. We're we're just trying to give kids a bit of constructive programming three times a week. Try and inspire them, try and educate them, entertain them, but we're not lifesavers. So it was, it was seeing it for what it was, and actually realizing very early on. I, I'd say the whole fame angle probably interested me for about six months, and after that, I just thought it's something so so hollow about it, you know, because you, you come away from a conversation where someone stopped you in the street and you realize they're not really asking anything about you. It's the fact that you're the guy they see on the telly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, it's it, I can see, and I know why fame is so seductive, but actually when you get it, it's actually a very empty thing that, that leaves far more questions than it ever answers. Now you said you had this uh, great expectation of a weight on your shoulders going into a Blue Peter as a Christian and it was, you know, there's plenty in the media. Um, just tell us a little bit about how you yourself became a Christian. Like, you know, you said your dad was a vicar, but how did it actually happen for you to become a Christian? Well, I, I mean, I obviously grew up in, in, in a Christian household, you know, so God was part of life and, and church was part of life. A lot of my best friends throughout all of my youth went to church. So I, I really enjoyed going to church. You know, I enjoyed going to see my friends and I knew it meant a lot for dad to have his family there, particularly when you get to that age where you can decide to opt out, you get into your teens and it's like, well, I'm, I'm going to sleep in today or I'm not going to go this week. You know, I know, I know from, for him, it, it gave him a, you know, it made him proud when, when he had all his, all of his family there. But yeah, you get to that, you get to that point in, in life where you begin to question things. But I, I often tell this story, um, not just because it's dramatic, but really it was the it was a seminal moment for me in going, Do you know, what? I, I actually this this God that I hear about on a Sunday, he, it's he's real. And we we were living in a, a small village in Grimston called Grimston in West Norfolk at the time. And I was seven years of age and it'd been one of those Saturday mornings where it just rained all morning. We were going stir crazy. Dad had been out at meetings and I had two sisters. So I've got two sisters, Becky and Hannah. Uh, Becky was six and Hannah was 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 not even one at this point. And we got to sort of lunchtime and, and the clouds cleared and the sun began to come out. And Dad said, look, let's just let's just get let's get out. Let's go for a walk. So we drove to some woods near where we live and went for a walk. And we were going down this big clearing in the middle of these woods. It's essentially just a massive pine forest, but there's other trees in there as well. And I'm at the age where if a tree's climbable, I was going up it. And we got to this really big kind of yew tree. And Thomas, sure enough, scampers up it and starts playing around. And then eventually I came and sat down with my legs dangling like this in the kind of U bit. And my, my dad was sort of stood here. I remember my sister Becky stood there. My mum was holding Hannah just in front and it started to rain again. And mum said, look, I, I think we should move to the other side of the clearing to get shelter. And we sort of looked at her like she was slightly barking mad because we were already being very nicely sheltered by this tree. And about half a minute later, she said it again. She said, no, I really do think we should move across the clearing to the other side. And again, mum's dad sort of said, oh, Jill, come on, you don't need, we don't need to move. And then I, when I can still, and this is, this is 41 years later, I can still see the look in her eye when she looked at me and dad and said, I really do think we need to move now. So to keep, keep the peace, dad said, look, come on, son, get down from the tree and let's move over to the other side, keep your mum happy. So over we went. And I would say probably 20 seconds later, as we get over the other side, it was like the, the roar of a tornado jet coming through the woods. Incredible sound. And I remember looking up and just seeing this kind of, it was like a, a, just like a tunnel of fire above our heads. And there was this almighty explosion. We can't see anything for the smoke. And then this huge thud um and as we looked as the smoke cleared 
The tree where I'd been sat not a minute ago had been blown apart by lightning. If you would like to contact us here at Life Stories Worldwide, you can. Simply by emailing lifestoriesworldwide at gmail.com or visit our website at lifestoriesworldwide.com. <laughs>